previously on Coram Deo. We all need to feel that we're winning in life. Let's take a look at Jacob. Jacob is the son of Isaac, who is the son of Abraham. Jacob's grandfather is a winner. Jacob's father is a winner. But Jacob's born a loser. Deception after deception after deception. And this looks like a pattern in Jacob's life. Trying to win, but feeling like a loser. Trying to win, doing whatever he can do to win, but inside knowing that he's violating something within him to win and it lands him in lose. It lands him in loserville. Today, I'm asking the question, have you ever found yourself in loserville? We've all gone through times in our lives that we didn't feel like winners. We can't tell if we're winning. We can't tell if we're headed in the right direction because we don't know what a win is. So my son, he's six years old, he's in soccer. And he's pretty good at, he's pretty good at it. But my son has no idea what the rules are. And I'm, I'm, I'm like trying to coach him. I'm like, listen, Bobby, you're on defense, which means that you have to defend this side. And, and he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And so then he runs out on the field and all, and all of a sudden the, the game goes and I look over at my son, he's like this. attention five of them on the same team same team kicking it at each other stealing the ball from each other and I'm like you're on the same team but they don't know what the rules are I feel like yelling that at the church sometimes when we're gossiping about each other when we're talking negatively about each other when when, when we can't rejoice for someone who got the promotion but but they're supposed to be a Christian too and I'm we're on the same team and we're playing this game of life. And I say, are you winning? You're like, I don't know, because I don't know what the rules are. Now I could sit up here today and I could give you all sorts of examples of what wins could be, but that would be too easy for you. Your journey in life is to discover the win for yourself. If you don't identify your win, someone else will define it for you. What's the win? What's the purpose? What's the goal? So I got a story for you the other day. And when I say the other day, I mean like a year ago. The other day I was driving down 211, which is the main road in our city here. And I got stuck at one of the thousand traffic lights in a one mile stretch of road, right? And by a thousand traffic lights, I mean five. But I'm stuck there and I'm not the first car at the light, I'm the second car, which means I'm behind somebody. Right? And now, I don't like being behind somebody at a traffic light because I, I like traffic lights. I believe that traffic lights are like, when it turns green, you should accelerate from zero to 30 as fast as you can. <laughs> That's what I feel that that means, okay? And so I'm the second car at the traffic light, and I'm looking at the car in front of me, and it appears to be a teenage girl texting on her phone. Now... No harm, no foul. The light's red. I've been there. I've done that. I've texted while the light is red. I get it. I know. If you're a police officer, I believe that there's some sort of uh, time frame that you can no longer give me a ticket for admitting to that crime. <laughs> but I've done it. I've done it before, right? But now the light turns green. Now you're on my time. <laughs> right? And instead of disengaging the brake and applying the gas pedal, she sits there texting. Now, I've got places to be. I've got places to be. So I do what every good Christian New Yorker does. I gave her a little quick beep on the horn. We all know the quick tap horn blast. The quick tap horn blast means I ain't mad at you. I'm not upset, but you're in my way, right? You're wrong. Wake up. Light turned green. It's time to go. That's what that means. She didn't get the hint. So now we have to escalate things. 
we've all read the DMV manual as to what the next level of escalation is, don't we? We all know it. We all know what the rules are. The rules are, you didn't hear the first little blast. We've got to escalate it to the double tap horn blast. The double tap horn blast goes like this, beep beep, which means I still ain't mad at you. But if you don't move, I'm gonna start feeling some sort of way. Huh? Yes, we know it, right? Beep beep, I'm not mad at you. And, and we even know, we know by doing it lightly and real quick, it's to say I'm not mad, but wake up. It's when you hold it, you're angry. You're, you're in road rage. You're in road rage. You need counseling, all right? <laughs> she, she gets the signal. She hears the double tap horn blast and she moves on. And I use that as an example today to say that there's been some times in my life that I feel like there's people in front of me stuck in life, not moving at the speed of life that I would want to move. I can watch people, I can look at people's lives and say, what kind of progress have you made in life in the last five years? And, and so today I'm not talking about the person who feels like they're stuck behind somebody else. We've all seen that, like a supervisor not taking any of your ideas or other people being promoted and you're not promoted. Like we get that. What I'm talking about today is like that young girl who's in front of me sightseeing through life, distracted through life, not knowing that there's a destination that she needs to get to, not living life with a sense of urgency in what we do, all right? My beeping was a way of sending her a message. I was speaking through the horn by saying to her, let's move. Let's move. Let's move along. And, and I want to tell you today that the God that Christians serve is a speaking God. He's a speaking God who speaks to us all the time. He's looking for opportunities to speak to you. Okay? You say, well, if God's a speaking God, he's not doing a really good job at it because I'm not hearing a thing. Just because we're not hearing God doesn't mean he's not speaking. I would tell you this, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, there's stories all the time of God speaking. God doesn't have a speaking problem. We have a hearing problem, right? Just because that girl in front of me didn't hear the single tap horn blast doesn't mean I didn't do it. Didn't mean I didn't pop, hey, what's up? Get out of my way, right? It, it was there. She wasn't paying attention. She wasn't paying attention to anything around her. It's like my son. He's six. My son loves technology. You give him an iPad, iPhone, uh, iPod, whatever, he's in this thing. He's in it. And, and it's just really strange. I don't, get, I don't get young people today. I don't understand it. I'm trying to. But he watches YouTube videos of other kids playing. I was raised in a generation that my mom and dad locked me outside. They locked me outside and said, go figure out something to do. And so we made like mud stuff, like we played in dirt. But my son enjoys watching other people play on the phone, right? And so I'm like, Poppy, let's play. Instead of watching somebody else play video games, let's play video games. I'm like, hey, son, how was your day today? Liam, what would you learn in school today? I'm like, yo, beep, beep. I'm about to take that phone, throw it out the window. And he's like, no, no. I so shut it off for five seconds, answer my, right? I, I just, spiritually, life, moving to what you're supposed to do and created and on this earth for, distracted. Distracted, vision, on the wrong things. I'm going to give you a huge insight today. Huge insight today to how God is speaking to us. How God is speaking. And, and I think part of the problem is 
we have a misconception of how God's speaking, right? Many of us have this idea that we have to work really hard to hear God speak. Anybody ever do this? They take a glass, pop against the wall? <laughs> Creepers, stalkers. My sister, my sister was older than me by two years, and she'd have her friends over, and, and they'd all hang out in her room, and I was like that creepy little brother. I'd have the cup to the wall, like, what do, what do girls do when they hang out? And they were like dancing or something. It wasn't cool, but we have this misconception. We're like trying to hear so intently, what's God trying to say? And we base all of our theology, all of our ideas on God by one Bible verse in the Bible. And it's in 1 Kings. And it says that Elijah heard from God speaking in a still, small voice. And so we define God's voice as a still, small voice. And we're straining to hear this still, small voice when I think a lot of times he's like, beep, beep. But we don't hear it. Whatever this is, whatever the distraction is, we don't hear it. Today I want to tell you this. Over 20 times in the Bible, over 20 times, verses 1, it says that God spoke to his people through dreams and visions. 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 And before you think I'm going to get all hocus pocus and say you got to fall asleep and have a dream from God when it was probably just a burrito that you had before you went to bed. I'm not talking about having to have an out-of-body experience like John when he wrote Revelation. What I'm talking about is when you have a God idea. When God speaks to you in your thoughts and in your ideas. And you have this idea and you're like, this might just be a million dollar idea. This is a great idea. I was thinking the other day about a company called DoorDash. We DoorDash. I don't know if you know what that is. DoorDash is you open up your phone and you order food and somebody drops it off at your house, right? It's, it's the greatest thing ever. They don't do nothing. The actual company DoorDash, they don't cook your food. They don't prep your food. They don't bag your food. They just order it for you. And then they send your order to a driver. They don't DoorDash don't drive your food. They don't do nothing. It's probably some dude in his pajamas, in his living room, just monitoring his servers to make sure that it doesn't go down. He just had this idea. Wonder if companies did not want to pay staff to be food deliverers and wonder if someone didn't want to have to go and get their food. We could deliver it to their job. Million dollar idea. Right? I believe that God can speak to us in thoughts, in ideas. But then there's a next step to that. I take that thought and I take that idea and I run it by the Bible. What does the Bible say about this thought that I had? About this dream that I had, this vision that I had? All right? I believe that this is how God is speaking to us today. In our series, we've been talking about Jacob. Jacob is on a mission, he's going to find a wife, he falls asleep, and he has a dream, he has a vision, where God appears to him and he says, I'm the God of your father and of your grandfather, I've blessed them and I want to bless you, the land that you're laying on is yours, as far as you can see, the north, south, east, west is yours, I will... I will give you descendants as the number of the stars in the sky. That's a big dream. That's a big vision that he has from God. And I want to show you this today. I want to break this down. In Proverbs 29, 18, it says this. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And I'm going to share this with you in a way that you probably have never heard it taught before. The word vision here is the word calzone. Calzone. Now, I, all the Italians just got hungry in here. They thought I said calzone. I ain't talking about that cheesy goodness of a calzone. Calzone. Calzone means 
dream, revelation, or vision, okay? So it says where there's no dreams, where there's no revelation, where there's no vision, people perish. Now what it's talking about here, it's not saying that you're gonna die physically. It's talking about your marriage perishes. Your hopes die. Your aspirations die. Your emotions die. Where there's no dreams about what's next, where we're going, what we're doing, what we're building. Hopes die. Maybe you remember early on in your marriage dreaming about what married life was going to be like, the kind of house we're going to have, 2.2 kids. That's just weird, right? (laughs) The American dream, 2.2 kids, a dog, white picket fence, two cars. Ah, everything's going to be amazing. We had this dream, and and as long as we had this dream that we are both working at together, everything was great. But then we reached those dreams, or we didn't get those dreams, and all of a sudden, things begin to die, and we end up being like the living dead, the walking dead. And maybe you have felt like that. Maybe you've just been feeling numb to life, and the only thing that's missing is a God-sized dream a God-sized dream, something deep on the inside that God has shown you or that God wants to show you. And listen, I can't show you that today. I can't bring you up here and lay my hand on you and tell you what God wants you to do in your life. That's part of the relationship with God. Another translation, the NIV says it like this. Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. And the word cast off restraint there means that they have the case of the who cares. Whatever, who cares? I'm not even going to try anymore. Whatever. I'm just giving up. Whatever. I'm giving up on this. I'm giving up on that. I'm giving up on my dreams. Doesn't matter anyway, does it? And that's what cast off restraint means. And unfortunately, there's too many of us that that's become our life's mantra. Who cares? Whatever. Just going through life in survival mode. Just going through life paycheck to paycheck with really no purpose or direction of what I'm building with my life. The message translation, it's a paraphrase and it says this. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. When they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. And the word blessed in the Hebrew means happy in their soul. When people are blessed, they are happy in their soul. So if someone says, hey man, how you doing? I say, and use the Christian terms, I'm blessed. You're saying I'm happy in my soul. So, so please, if someone says, how you doing? Don't say, I'm blessed. Because <laughs> you obviously ain't happy in your soul, all right? It means happy in the soul. There's soul contentment that we can find when we're living a life that actually matters. And so I have one goal today. My big idea, my mission today is this, to get you dreaming again. To get you dreaming again. And if you're already a dreamer, If you're already like me and you're constantly going and you're constantly dreaming and you're constantly making things better, I want to challenge you today to dream even bigger. To dream even bigger. There's this song. I'm going there, Pastor Brian. I'm sorry. But there's this song on the Christian radio that I literally want to rip the stereo out of my car and throw it out every time I hear it. It's like, dream small. And basically he's talking about like it was a tiny rock that took Goliath down, so dream small. And I'm like, that dude has failed so many times in his life that he's lowered the bar that now he's writing songs about dreaming small. Yeah, I know. I knew that wasn't going to go very well. I shouldn't have said it. (laughs) As I look over my life, I'm going to be transparent with you for a moment. Be be vulnerable with you for a moment. As I look over my life, 
There have been times when I have been at my best and when I have been at my worst. I hope you kind of like can gauge yourself and be honest when you've been really great and when you've been really bad. And there's been times that I've gotten stuck for months at a time at my worst, where I know I'm being nasty to people, when I know I have an attitude, when I know I'm not being life-giving and cheerful, and, and when someone brings me an idea, I crush it, not because it wasn't a good idea, but because I didn't think of it. Right? Because we all want to win, and I couldn't possibly give somebody else a win when I don't feel like I'm winning. That, that's what that is. Throwing it out there, okay? Listen, when I'm at my best and I'm at my worst, I can look back and say and see a direct correlation to how much dreaming and visions I have on the inside of me. So when I have no dream and no vision, I'm depressed. I'm not happy and life's not going well. When there's no dreams or visions inside of me, I don't let anybody else win around me. Come on, I'm just, I'm showing you guys, come on. But every time, regardless of my circumstance, when I start dreaming again, when I have vision again, I feel happier and I feel healthier. Every time I have a project to work on, I feel happier and I feel healthier. And I don't know if you know this, you probably don't, but in the Bible, the word dream and the word health are so close together in, in, in how to write them and what they mean, that the translators of the Bible many times didn't know which one to use. The, the, the words are synonymous. They're interchangeable with dream and with health. Dreams and health are almost the same exact word. And I want you to think about that for a minute. That you can get healthy again in your soul. You can get healthy again in your marriage. You can get healthy again in your finances if you had a dream again. If you had a vision again. I'm just saying, listen, when, when you knew you were saving for something big, your finances were healthier. It's once you got the house and you reached the goal that you screwed it all up again. Now you got the house, I was like, now we gotta furnish this thing, credit card, credit card, credit card. But when we had the dream, and we had the vision, and we had the goal, and we were working towards something, we felt healthier, we felt alive. Come on, somebody. Circumstances don't determine your happiness. Your dreams, your revelations, and your visions do. I'm just saying, my, my, dad, my dad preached this message a few years ago, and he made this statement. He says, once stretched by a vision, you're never the same again. Once stretched by a vision, you're never the same again. And I know in my own life, when opportunities come, whether they work themselves out or not, whether it actually comes to life or not, when I let myself start dreaming of what if... I can't deny that I dream those dreams. I can't deny the fact that I let myself go there and say, if my checkbook wasn't the problem, what would I do? If I knew I couldn't fail, what would I try to attempt? Once stretched by a question like that, and I let myself dream those dreams, I can't step back and pretend that that dream doesn't exist. Check this passage out. In Psalm 126, it says, when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, when we were attentive to what God was doing, God did something in our lives, we were like those who dream. When, when we saw what God was doing, we allowed ourselves to dream. We began to dream. And look what that dream did. Then, after we dreamed, after we let ourselves go there, watch, there was laughter in our mouths. Some of us just need to laugh again. Do you, do you know what probably brought you together the, in the first place in your relationship, whoever you have relationships with, is that you probably had a good time together. You probably laughed together. 
in, in, in work, I love hearing our staff laugh, right? Like if I hear the staff like at, at one of the tables laughing, I have to like get up and like come over there and like eavesdrop on them, what are they laughing at? <laughs> and when I hear people laugh, it makes me laugh. And I don't even know what the punchline was. But because I hear their laughter, it makes me laugh. They're probably even laughing at me. <laughs> True story. The other day, I walk in there dying laughing. And I'm like, <laughs> like, what are you guys laughing at? And they turned the computer around, and it was me, like, dancing on stage. And <laughs> they were going to put it in the recap video. I said, just please don't put the clip of me twerking. I went too far. God was not well pleased with that dance. <laughs> Watch. Then, then our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with singing. When's the last time you woke up with a song on your heart and you were in the shower just singing a song at the top of your lungs totally off key? Watch. Then they said among the nations, our dreaming affected the nations. Our laughter affected the nations. Our singing affected the nations because what God was doing in our lives and in our dreams, watch. Then the nations said, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. We're glad. Because if God's doing it for them, he'll be doing it for us. Does anybody in here today have a bucket list? A bucket list, it's a list of things that you want to accomplish before you kick the bucket. Okay, if you don't, no shame, but I gave you a piece of paper today, it's on your seat. Could you think of five things, five things that you want to do before you kick the bucket? Five cool things, five great things, five amazing things, whatever. It's there. That's for you. That's for your mirror or your wallet or whatever. I think the first five things are the hardest to write down. The first five. Because we like try to get real deep in our soul, but like, what do you want to do? Something fun. Like, for me, one of them is I want to fly a plane. Like, one of those little prop planes where I take control and I scare the guy next to me. Ah. I've never done it. Flying actually scares me, but I want to try flying one day. Like, actual, my hands on the controls. It may scare the tar out of me, but that's okay. Mm. Just because your knees are shaking doesn't mean you're not in faith to dream. There's a story in the Bible of someone named, this is totally off notes, there's someone in the Bible named David who steps out to fight a giant named Goliath. And we all think that he just ran out there and he was just totally like the most confident thing ever. But I bet you as he stood there, he knew what God was gonna do. He had built, killed the bear, he had killed the lion, but I still think that the nerves got to him. I think there was still that moment where he was like, I'm just gonna do it scared. I I'm gonna do this thing scared. Even Jesus, the night before he was going to be betrayed, went to the Garden of Gethsemane. I know what I have to do, but if this cup could pass for me. Come on, some of us have been afraid to dream again. And even writing something down on a piece of paper scares us. But I'll tell you this, if you could write five things that you want to do in your lifetime, you're going to write a hundred. Once you break through that limit of dream, you'll write a hundred. Real quick, there's five types of dreams in this room today. There's five types of people in this room who have dreams. The first person is this, you have no dream. Your dream is no dream. You don't have a dream. You have none. So when I sit there and say, what do you wanna be when you grow up? What do you wanna do with your life? I don't know, I've never thought about it. I've never thought about it, I just do what I do. I have the job that I have because I put out applications and someone hired me. It's not like I wanna do it. It just pays the bills. There's, there's no dream, okay? And, and I don't wanna be ugly, and I'm not trying to be confrontational, 
But chances are, if you have no dream for your life, there might not be any God in your life. Because one thing I know about God is that when he comes into your life and he's close to you, he'll drop dreams on you. He'll drop dreams on you, okay? The Bible says in Hebrews 11 that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the substance of things hoped for. And as soon as you have faith in your heart and you get close to God, he starts dropping dreams. Now, whether we're listening or not, beep, beep, whether he's got our attention or not, beep, beep. That's up to us. That's up to us. When we get connected to a living God, we dream again. We dream again. The second type of person here today, you have a wrong dream. A wrong dream. Now listen, by the wrong dream, I'm not saying that it's a bad dream. I'm not saying it's a sinful dream. I'm just saying it's just a dream that it means nothing. Okay? Let's just throw this out there. I dream I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be a millionaire. For what reason? For what reason? So I can have a car. I can have my house. Oh, so you, you want to be a millionaire, but you don't want to be generous. Wait, what? Why would I say I want to be a millionaire and then give my money away? To help other people? To stand in the gap? To to help place babies in homes for parents who don't want them? That if the church is going to raise a standard that say, hey, that all lives, that we want to stand in the gap for lives for the unborn, but then we won't open our homes to adoption? Come on, I'm just saying, guys. It's not a bad dream. It's just, it's only got earthly standards. It's nothing that's going to stand the eternal test. Now, God doesn't have anything against us having earthly dreams, but he wants to come alongside and connect to it. Watch, in Acts 20, 24, Paul is speaking. He says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me. So I'm going I'm to translate this to you. It says this. Paul is saying, I have found my greatest joy in life doing what God asks me to do. I have found my greatest joy doing what God wants for me. I have found my greatest joy helping other people. Huh? And how do I get to that place? How do I get to that place where what I want lines up with what God's, God wants? And it's, it's a really difficult word, and it's countercultural in our society today, and it's the word called surrender. Surrender. I surrender my life and my future to God's design. To God's design. Mm. Third type of person third type of dream is the stale, stagnant dream. The stale dream or the stagnant dream. You had a dream that burned within you one time so brightly. You were so fired up about that dream. And either through delay or some set of problems that you didn't see coming, the dream is now barely flickering. Maybe you dreamed of having kids one day and that didn't happen. Maybe you dreamed of being married one day and you've gotten older and you're not married yet. Maybe you had a dream of being financially free. Maybe you had a dream of being a business owner. Whatever that, whatever that thing is, through delay or a set of circumstances that you didn't see coming, it's just barely hanging on. You, you know what that dream was, but you've stopped thinking about it. And now it's beginning to die out. My heartbeat today and my mission today is to do what Paul commanded Timothy. In 2 Timothy 1.6, Paul tells him, for this reason, I remind you, son, I remind you, Timothy, to fan into flame the gift of God, which came to you through the laying on of hands. Flam, fl- uh, fl- <laughs> flam. 
fan into flame the dream that once burned inside of you. My calling today is to stand up here and say, beep, 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 beep. Life is still ahead of you. It's time to engage the gas pedal again and fan into flame that dream that was inside of you once again. I know it's been a long time. I know that you've been dreaming that dream a long time. And I know that you've gone in through circumstances that's delayed your dream. But God still wants to do something in your life. And, and, and um, between services, I wrote something down on a piece of paper in the back there. And I don't know who this is for, but you're hearing all this. You said, but I did all my dreams, Sonny. Hey, Sonny, I'm older than you. I've already done all my dreams. I've already accomplished all my dreams. All right, I'm not as smart as you, but this is what I kind of think. If you're still breathing, you may have accomplished your dreams, but God hasn't done everything he wants to do yet. If you still got breath in your lungs, it's for a reason, all right? There's still some things that he needs to accomplish and you, because you're so successful, happen to be the best option. Dream again. Let him speak to you again. Let him fan into flame. Do something radical for the kingdom of God. The next type of person is the vague dream. I want to do something. I got some dreams. Hey, yeah, I got a bucket list. Show me. Well, it's, it's vague. It's a vague dream. You have ideas. You have hopes. But you don't have concrete dreams. I'm going to share with you a very abstract verse in the Bible. It's hard to understand. Theologians have been trying to decode this verse for centuries, and, and hopefully we can understand it today. I mean, it's deep. I'm going to give you a lot of background behind it. Ready? Ready? It's Habakkuk 2.2, and it says, write it down. Write it down. Make it plain so that those who see it may run with it. I know that's hard to get. But if you haven't written your dream down, it's not a dream. It's just a thought. Write it down. There's something that happens psychologically when you write something down in your own handwriting and you see it. There's something even more powerful when you take that same pen and check it off. Write it down. Make it plain. Right? Then there's the last type. The God kind of dream. The God-sized dream. The God-sized dream is one of those dreams. And here's the tension that I have. Do I dare to write down a dream that I know I can never do? Yes, you do. Those are God-sized dreams. Those are God-sized dreams. Yeah, but you just said you can never do it. I can't. But God can. But God can. It's a, I can't do it unless God. But only God. If God. I, I'll share one, okay? So when I was a teenager, I don't remember what age I was, but I wrote it down in the back of one of my Bibles when I was a teenager. Um, we were at like a, I don't know if we were at our old building or we were at teen camp. I don't remember the setting, but I was in like a, one of those settings where we were singing songs and the lights were off and I was laying on the floor. And I, I daydreamed, right? I was awake, but I saw something. And I saw myself as an older, handsome man standing on stage. <laughs> I'll be honest, I didn't see this coming. I didn't see this. I had hair in my dream. Beautiful, flowing hair. All right. <laughs> I saw myself as a man standing on a stage holding a microphone and it was a big stage and there was these lights that were shining on me now years ago if there was going to be multicolor lights shining on you it's because they took a, a color gel and slid it over the light but it wasn't those kind of lights but there was these multicolor lights so all I can say is that they were LED lights but they didn't have that back when I had this dream 
I was on a stage with these multicolored lights shining on me, and I was in a, an arena in front of thousands, tens of thousands of people. I was like, y'all, that's so cool. Two years ago, I got a call from Pastor Joel Osteen's ministry, and they said, hey, we're going to be in Albany, New York. Would you join us for a night of hope and get on stage and, and do a blessing over the Hudson Valley? I mean, I was scared. I was scared. I mean, it's one thing being on stage in your own building. It's another thing being on stage with, like, everybody else. I was scared. But I had a responsibility, right? My responsibility to make the dream happen was to say yes. Was to say yes. It was a God-sized dream. I saw it. I knew it. I knew what I was supposed to do. But I still had to say yes. And I'm going to be honest. I've been doing this for almost 30 years, right? I've been talking in front of people for a long time. And when I got on that stage and those lights in front of tens of thousands of people, I felt like the little kid at the spelling bees. <laughs> and it wasn't until it was over that I was in the back that I remembered the dream that I had. I remember that this is the moment that I saw. And I couldn't have done that on my own. One, I couldn't afford to rent that stadium. And two, if I could, we would only have about 500 people. <laughs> right? The dream I had was an only God dream. It was an only God kind of dream. Now, not every dream needs to be an only God dream. But there needs to be one on there. There needs to be something that big. Maybe doctors told you you'll never do X, Y, Z. They need an only God dream. There's littler things, like I wanna fly a plane one day. I wanna climb a mountain one day. I wanna do an overnight deep sea fishing trip. I wanna do a survival weekend where like, if I don't catch any fish, I don't eat. Like one of those kind of things. I don't know why, it's on my list. I got church things that I want to see happen. I want other campuses and multi-site, and I want to grow the church. I want to see a certain number of people saved and baptized through our church. Like, I've got all these, but I'm just saying in your own life, you've got to have the ones that you know you can work towards and make happen. And there's other ones that you've got to put on a list that you know, I can never do this unless God. Unless God. So today, as we close out, I wanna to talk to that first group of people who you have no dream and you kinda of know it's because you don't have God in your life. You've never had an opportunity to you know, make that decision to be a Christian and I'm not even trying to pressure you into that today. I'm just saying, if you're feeling inside of you right now a beep beep, a beep beep going on inside, like it's time to move. It's time to make a decision. It's time to change your life. It's time to go ahead and, and grab a hold of a belief system that you can run with, with a God that loves you. Then I say today, we're all with you. Beep, beep. Let's get it done. And here at Family Church, we pray a prayer together. And it goes like this. Repeat, repeat, repeat it with me. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Woo! I just want to take two seconds. If you prayed that for the first time, would you allow me the honor to celebrate you real quick and just wave at me? Hey, that was me. I prayed that for, yeah, man, I see you. Yeah, I see you. Anybody else? Yeah, I see you. Anybody else real quick? Yeah, I see you. Awesome. Back there, awesome. Awesome. Great, great, great. We love you. We, we thank you for being here today. Uh, we're going to get ready to, to sing two more songs, and I know you have your communion. We're going to do the communion in between these last two songs. But before we come back and, and do these two songs, I want to prepare us for a moment to, to give to God.
to invest in what God is doing in the kingdom of God. We call that tithes and offerings here at Family Church. And, and here's, I'm gonna do a quick teaching. Is that all right? Like literally like a one minute teaching. There's, there's steps in everything that we do. There's steps in life, there's steps in dreaming, and there's steps in giving. Today, maybe you've never tried investing into Christianity or what God is doing. We ask, try God today. Try him at his word. M- make, make a one-time investment and donation in what God's doing in family church. Maybe you've done that before, but you've never made giving a regular practice of what you do. Then make it a regular practice, right? Like going to the gym once a year doesn't do a whole lot, but if you go to the gym for 30 minutes every day, it makes a difference. So if you made it a regular part of what you do, maybe you've been a regular giver, but you've never been a percentage-based giver. We call it tithing then maybe that's what you'd like to do. You'd like to be a percentage-based giver and try God and honor him with the tithe. Maybe you've been a tither and you've done that for years, but you're ready to step into being a kingdom builder. Maybe you've never even heard of that. Kingdom builder is someone who goes above and beyond a a percentage giving and they invest in the next generation of what God's doing. That's, you you do percentage-based and then you give towards missions and you give towards teen camps and you give towards the building fund and different things like that. There's always a next step in in, in what we're doing for God and how we're impacting the kingdom, amen? Father, we present our tithe and our offering to you today. We pray that you use it for your kingdom, for your glory and your honor. We wanna honor you with what we're doing today in Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, you may serve the people and we're gonna go ahead and sing some more songs.